Now, <clears throat> at the end of class uh, yesterday, or on, on Monday, it became evident to me that uh, there are a number of people in the class who do not feel totally comfortable with uh, tensor analysis and differential geometry. And I was hoping to sort of do a little bit as I went along as part of the physics and everybody would have seen enough that, uh, that they felt comfortable, but I think that's not uh, really the case. And so what I'm going to do today is simply stop for one and a half hours and do only mathematics. And then uh, on Monday, I will return to the physics. So I'm going to do the mathematics of uh, vector and tensor algebra, uh, uh, both abstract and with, uh, with uh, coordinates and with bases. I'm going to uh, do differentiation of tensors, connection coefficients. Uh, I will do curvature, uh, the Riemann curvature tensor. Uh, and that's about all I'm going to do. And I think that at least one third of the people in uh, cl this class already know this subject cold, and I would appreciate their leaving. <laughs> thank you, thank you. You're warming the cockles of my heart, Michael. Uh, you're warming my heart <laughs> by leaving. Goodbye. <laughs> and there are a lot more of you that I know, I, uh, I know you know. You don't need to be in here, Patricia. Uh, uh, so please, when you start getting bored, walk out. I, I want to direct this at the people who are not familiar with this subject. and. Uh, and so if you're just bored, uh, please just don't, don't hesitate to walk out. So there will be almost no physics at all, just mathematics. Uh, I am giving you on this assignment sheet a recommended reading that contains the material I'm doing, but it contains it sort of interspersed with the physics. And I thought that it would be useful to just do the mathematics in one lump, uh, which is not the way it's done in the reading that I'm giving to you. Uh, so you just see it as a, math, a piece of mathematics, which we then can use uh, next week. We'll focus in on the physics. Okay, <clears throat> so I want to talk about space-time, which is a four-dimensional manifold. It's a four-dimensional space that is sufficiently smooth that we can do all the things that physicists want to do. Uh, or we could be talking about any other manifold. Manifold is a fancy uh, mathematical word that just means a space that is sufficiently smooth uh, that uh, you can do things you want to do, basically. Um, and so this manifold has points. The points, such as this point P, if we're talking about two-dimensional space of the blackboard, it's the obvious thing. It's what I've drawn. Uh, in space-time, a point is an event. It's a particular location in space at a particular moment of time. And so a point is a fundamental elementary uh, concept that we deal with in, in uh, this subject. And uh, then we also have, for points that are uh, very close together, we can draw a little arrow reaching from one point to the other. And I'll label that as delta p with an arrow over it. And that's a vector. But as I uh, hinted at yesterday, on Monday, you have a problem with long vectors in the sense that long vectors don't live in the manifold if the manifold is curved. They live in a tangent space. And so if I want to draw a vector as something that reaches from one point to another, it's got to be real short. And it exists as a well-defined vector only in the limit as it becomes arbitrarily short. But I will use that as an elementary concept from which to build up long vectors in a moment. <clears throat> so this is a separate. So I have a point P, delta P is a separation vector and is meaningful only if the, uh, this vector is arbitrarily small. So this separation vector does live in the manifold when it's arbitrarily small. Then I want to talk about a curve, which is a point that varies as you vary some parameter. So zeta is a real number that varies over some range, such as from 0 to 1. And so here is such a curve. Here is the point P of 0, here's the point P of 1, here's the point P of 2. And then we have the concept of a tangent vector, the vector that is tangent to this curve, which is, I will write as dp d zeta, zeta being the parameter along the curve, 
and that is defined as the limit as delta zeta goes to zero of the separation vector that reaches from p of zeta plus delta zeta to p of zeta that's a separation vector and then I divide by delta zeta and take the limit so when delta zeta is very small this is a meaningful separation vector that actually lives in the manifold but then I blow it up and make it big by dividing by delta zeta and taking the limit and when it becomes big it lives in the tangent space as I, in the manner that I described uh, before what are you doing here Alan I'm just going to do mathematics today you should go away <laughs> okay so so this this guy this guy lives in the ta in the tangent space uh, that, so that if for example my manifold were the surface of the earth and uh, my curve is running over the surface of the earth and this is a little delta zeta uh, uh, between reaching from the point zeta plus delta zeta here back to, to the point from the point of p of zeta to p of zeta plus delta zeta and then when I take this limiting process I get that vector that lies in the tangent space that is a flat space tangent in some higher dimensional embedding space tangent to the curved space and so if you do this uh, mathematically in the language of embeddings uh, if you want to take four dimensional space time and embed it in a higher dimensional flat space and you want to be able to do it always including preserving topology I'm told it takes 96 dimensions and so here's a tangent space that lives in 96 dimensions flat and that vector lies in it um, if you don't want to preserve topology you can get by with a lot less than 96 dimensions so that's one way to think about it I'm going to re uh, return to this issue of what is the meaning of a tangent vector in a few minutes because rigorous mathematicians feel very uncomfortable with talking about it in this way they want something that they can feel much more confident of what they're doing okay. for the moment the tangent vector is defined by that limiting process um, so these are a set of fundamental concepts that we deal with all of them coordinate independent but we also want to deal with coordinate systems uh, as useful computational tools and so I denote the coordinates by x alpha as a function of p where alpha runs over the dimensions of the manifold so it's from 0 1 2 3 in space-time it would run from 1 to 2 on the surface of the blackboard and uh, so for example x0 is just some function of p so you, uh, you pick a point p in the manifold and x0 has some value this is the point p x0 may have some value 17 for example and so this is a real valued function of location in the manifold uh, and these are four real valued functions for location in the manifold but there's a one-to-one -one mapping at least over some coordinate patch a one-to-one -one mapping between points and coordinate values so p can be regarded also as a function of x0 x1 x2 and x3 or we write this more generally as p is a function of x alpha where the uh, the x alpha really means the full set of coordinates x0 x1 x2 x3 uh, and so uh, we can regard the point as a function of the coordinates or the coordinates as a function of the point either one so the point and the coordinates uh, carry the same information they identify the event in space time but that p is not the same as the curve that's, everybody that's right and so and this is a, a good mathematician would not use the same the same symbols this is q Okay. Um, that, that is uh, this is some other function uh, and so I might have a point Q here and I regard Q this point as being some function of those four variables yeah. okay now having introduced a coordinate system then from that coordinate system I can build a, a basis for vectors so this is called the coordinate basis associated with this coordinate system 
In this coordinate basis, I will write the basis vectors E alpha, with alpha running from 0 to 3 in space time. And they are defined to be the derivative of P. Uh, well, I've used the symbol Q up here. So the derivative of Q uh, with respect to x alpha, partial derivative. Uh, and that's holding the other x's fixed. And so if I draw, for example, on the surface of this sphere up here, if the, my, this sphere were the manifold, and if I have uh, spherical polar coordinates on here, this is my coordinate system. And uh, so that uh, phi, the coordinate phi runs in that direction, uh, the coordinate theta runs in this direction. Then one of the basis vectors is E phi, and that's the derivative of my point Q, uh, which is a function of phi and theta. With respect to phi, holding a theta fixed. And so let me just draw that. Um, so derivative with respect to phi, uh, here is let's say phi equals 0. And uh, phi equal pi over 2 is somewhere over here. So phi equal 1 is about there. And so the derivative of q with respect to phi holding theta fixed is a vector that has about this length, but it lives in the tangent space. It is the vector that is uh, mo going along, that is obtained by differentiating along the curve of fixed theta, with phi being the parameter along that curve. And uh, it has a length that corresponds, a pro roughly speaking, to going from phi equals 0 to phi equal uh, 1, except that it's living up in the tangent space. So that's a picture of that, of that vector, but it's defined uh, by the limiting process that I defined up here. So that's, e f that's the vector E phi. And similarly, the vector uh, E theta is going to be something like this. And those vectors span a tangent space. And the tangent space is, a, is the two-dimensional plane that is tangent to the Earth at this point. And so they span this tangent space. And all of the uh, tensor, vector and tensor analysis that we do at that point is done in this flat plane that is the tangent space. And if we were doing this at a different point, the tangent space would be a different tangent space. And the vectors that we would be dealing with would be living in that tangent space. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Then, once we have a basis which we obtain from the coordinate system, then we can define components of a vector. So let's suppose that my vector is A. Uh, that vector is actually dp d zeta for some, along some curve uh, p of zeta. So p of zeta may be some curve that's in here. And so A is a vector that is tangent to that curve uh, at this point. So A may be this vector here living in that flat plane. And I can just expand that A as A alpha E alpha uh, sum over alpha in the usual way you would do in vector analysis. Okay. Now, as I mentioned on Monday, I want to abandon writing down all these summation signs. So whenever I have a repeated index, in this case, with one index up and the other down, for reason, and the reasons for this will become clear later on, there is automatically assumed to be a summation. So this is a sum A0, E0, plus A1, E1, A2, E2, A3, E3. Um, 
This vector is dp d zeta. That means we all obviously also can write it as partial of p with respect to x alpha dx alpha d zeta, just using the mathematics of, uh, of uh, differential calculus, but where one of the entities in here is a point, uh, rather than a, uh, uh, is a point. But nevertheless, all the mathematics of differential calculus goes over when we're talking about differentiating points in this way, because that algebra of differential calculus is based on the limiting process that's used in defining uh, derivatives. And, uh, it's based on nothing else. We've used the same limiting process in defining derivatives of points to get ourselves uh, uh, tangent vectors as uh, we always do in, in calculus. Okay. Now this dp dx alpha is e alpha and so this must be the component a alpha and so that tells us that in a coordinate system uh, and, in, and in a coordinate basis the component of uh, this vector, the component is a alpha is partial of p with respect to x. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. The component is dx alpha d zeta. So the alpha component of a tangent vector is just the derivative of the coordinate with respect to the parameter along the curve. So ne next, let me talk about uh, directional derivatives. Now, for the moment, directional derivatives are things that differentiate scalar fields. So I have some scalar field that lives in my manifold, lives in space-time, or a scalar field that lives uh, in the two-dimensional surface of the Earth. Uh, and let me call that scalar field psi. It's a function of location in the manifold. And I want to discuss the derivative along my vector a of psi. Now, that derivative along the vector a of psi, since a is d p d z, let, let me back up. I, I want to think about how, how to present it, OK? Let me present it by appealing to your prior experience of what this thing ought to be. Your prior experience is that that ought to be a alpha d psi dx alpha. That's what you would regard as the derivative along a of some scalar field from prior experience. Okay. So that says that uh, since we're asking about the operator that differentiates psi that says that this is the operator. That is, that dA, the derivative along A, is A alpha d e by dx alpha. A alpha, of course, is just dx alpha d zeta, partially with respect to x alpha. And so this is really just d by d zeta along the curve. And by that, what I mean is that d psi, dA, the derivative along A of psi, is just d by d zeta of psi regarded as a function of the point P, which depends on the parameter zeta as we move along the curve. So in this sense, the derivative along a of psi, where a is the tangent vector to this curve, that's just the same thing as d by d zeta along the curve, where what is meant by this is when you differentiate along the curve, you do the derivative in this manner. Now, a physicist will look at this formula and look at this formula and we'll say, look, I have the same coefficients when I expand the vector in terms of the coordinate basis. I have the same coefficient. 
is when I expand this directional derivative in terms of these partial derivatives. Absolutely the same coefficient. And it's going to be true for all vectors. And so there is a precise one-to-one -one mapping between a directional derivatives and vectors. And if you're talking about things in terms of components, components of a directional derivative being the components that appear when you expand the derivative along A in this form, when you're talking about components for the directional derivative and components for the vector, those components are identically the same for every vector. And so that's rather striking to a physicist. And a physicist who wants to be lazy would say, gee, uh, any algebra that I do with vectors, uh, I can, uh, the same algebra must carry over in some sense with uh, directional derivatives. Now a mathematician, most mathematicians, and this subject was being developed in its uh, modern day form in the 1920s or so, most mathematicians looked at these kinds of issues and said, I don't know what a vector really means. I feel uncomfortable with this, uh, with this embedding process. I feel uncomfortable with what does that limiting process really mean. But I know very clearly what a directional derivative is. I know very clearly what this expression means. And so the mathematician says, I'm going to henceforth ignore that discussion of vectors. And I will define a vector to be a, different, a directional derivative. And I will ban from my language this physicist's description of vectors in terms of arrows, uh, in terms of separations between points, in terms of tangent planes. And I will use my, in my language always forever thereafter, a vector, the vector A is this directional derivative. And the physicist says, okay, you get away with that because there's an isomorphism between the vectors and the directional derivative, so you can get away with it. I don't like it, it feels uncomfortable, but it's all right. You mathematicians can go ahead and do that. But it turns out, even for a physicist, it's often useful to think of vectors as, and differential derivatives as being the same. And I will do that from time to time in this course. Okay. Does everybody feel comfortable with this now? Can you give an example of how one would use it? Um, I will give an example a little later when I talk about commutators. Okay, so I'll, we will see some examples as I go along. Okay. okay, so what that means is that henceforth I will say, I will sometimes write interchangeably A, D, A, uh, D, P, D, Zeta, or D by D, Zeta. And those all mean the same thing if I'm taking the mathematician's viewpoint that uh, vectors are differential uh, operators or are directional derivatives. Similarly, uh, where I write d by t dp dx alpha for a basis vector, it uh, takes a little bit of extra energy to write this p, and so I will typically write d by dx alpha for my basis vector. Uh, just being a lazy physicist, I'll adopt the mathematician's uh, point of view, and that's the basis vector. Okay. Questions? Are you still in the tangent space here? So, um, the vector still is in the tangent space, and to the mathematician, the tangent space is the space uh, that is made up by the uh, directional derivatives at a point. And so it's the space of directional derivatives at, the, at a point. But the directional derivatives have their own space, although they differentiate inside the manifold. Okay. Other questions? Okay. okay, tensors. Tensors, at least to me when I was an undergraduate here at Caltech, uh, a half century ago or so, um, the tensor was a very sophisticated concept. And only later did I learn that the tensors are utterly trivial. So a tensor T is something that has several slots into which you are invited to put vectors 
you get out a real number that is linear in the vectors. And I like to draw, just as I draw pictures of tense of vectors as arrows, I will sometimes draw a picture of a tensor it has slots and it has computer paper. And the computer, you stick the vectors in the slots and the computer paper rolls out and, and you get some real number, 17. So that's a picture of a tensor. Now a mathematician would have said this very simply, that a tensor T is a linear real valued function of vectors. So that in particular T of alpha A plus beta B C and D is equal to alpha T of A C D plus beta T of B C D. So that's the linearity relation and these are all real numbers. So that's all there is to a tensor. Okay. So let me give you an example of a tensor. Let's suppose, I'm going to explain where we get this from in a minute, but let's suppose we have, uh, suppose we have an inner, a meaning of some inner product. So you all know about inner products in vector analysis. And that is something where you take two vectors A and B and you get out a real number. Uh, and obviously, from all your prior experience with vector analysis, this real number is a linear function of A and B. It's linear in A and B. And so that means that I can define, if I have an inner, inner product that has been given to me by somebody, I can then define a tensor called the metric tensor, G, and I have defined it as soon as I have told you how to compute the real number that you get out when you put vectors into its slots. And as soon as I have verified that that real number is linear in the vectors. So the metric tensor has two slots. You put a vector A into the first slot, a vector B into the second slot, and the definition is that what you get out is this inner product. So that's prescription, and it's a prescription that is indeed linear in A and B, so that's the definition of a tensor, and that is the metric tensor. Okay. Um, so where do we get the inner products from? So if we're working on the surface of the Earth uh, or some other uh, manifold that uh, has what we call a positive definite metric, but let me not go into that at this point, simply say something like the surface of the Earth or something like Euclidean three-dimensional space. Let's draw it on the surface of the Earth. Um, and if I have then a separation vector, so it's got to be a little tiny separation vector uh, uh, in order to lie in the manifold, delta p, and this is in a, a space, it's not in space time, so I'll draw a squiggly underline instead of a vector, an arrow over it. I just like to do this to distinguish uh, space from space time. Okay. Then the inner product of p with itself, which we might call delta Delta, or delta P with itself, delta P squared, is defined to be the length of delta P squared, where length is measured by setting down a ruler in here, on here. So that defines an inner product of an infinitesimal vector with itself, 
linearity then gives you the inner product of any great big vector that points in the same direction as itself, just linearity of the inner product. So we have inner products of vectors with themselves, and then a dot b by vector analysis must just be one fourth a plus b squared minus a minus b squared. So from the inner product of this vector with itself and the inner product of that vector with itself, uh, we can construct this combination, which gives us the inner product with, of A with B. And so the key point is that if you're in a manifold where you have a concept of distance corresponding in the manifold, distance along some curve, uh, distance, uh, say, between two adjacent points that are very close together, if you have that concept, from that, you can get the inner product. And from the inner product, you get the metric. metric. So in space-time, similarly, in space-time, appealing back to what you know from special relativity already, uh, if I go to a small region in space-time, even though space-time may be curved, in a small region of space-time, I can introduce a local Lorentz frame and talk about things in the language of special relativity. So I have time-like vectors, I have space-like vectors. If I have a time-like vector, so, so I have a, a, a tiny time-like vector that lives in the, in the space-time ma manifold, delta p, and here it is, it reaches from this point, that event, to this, this e event. We know from special relativity, applied here in the small, we know that uh, it's possible to find a reference frame. Uh, uh, well, let me start over again. Because this is a time-like separation, there exists a world line for a particle that moves along that uh, vector. And so, as seen in, that, in the inertial frame of a particle, it moves along the vector. This vector points entirely in the time direction. And this particle carries with itself an ideal clock. And you can ask how much proper time does that clock tick in moving from the tail of the vector to the tip of the vector. That proper time is delta tau. When I want to square it, I want to put on a minus sign, uh, and that is defined. It's the definition of delta p squared. So having the basic physical concepts of special relativity, of inertial reference frames, of ideal clocks, we can thereby define for time-like vectors what is the inner product of a tiny time-like vector with itself. If we have a tiny space-like vector, call it delta q, then in that case we know, and let's suppose that it, that space-like vector looks like this, then we know that we can find a reference frame in which this space-like vector uh, lies in a surface of constant time. And if I draw this in the manner that one usually does in a space-time diagram, that reference frame is one where the observer moves like this. So that's the observer's world line. And the surfaces of constant time as seen by the observer are these surfaces. And that observer can then, at a moment of, uh, of constant time of the observer, measure what is the length, the spatial length of this vector. And that observer will get some um, uh, special spatial length, delta s squared. And the definition of the inner product of this delta q with itself is delta q squared is plus delta s squared. So this is the way one then gets inner products in this manner, having that inner product of and of course, for null vectors, uh, the inner product with itself is zero. And so you have it for all infinitesimal vectors, and then you go through the same process as I did in Euclidean space, 
and then back to here, and you've got the metric. Now, this way of talking about the metric uses a treatment of time as being a real number. In some abominable textbooks, they, they introduce a time coordinate, x4, it's usually called it as ICT, where i is the square root of minus 1, c is the speed of light, and t is time. I would like to know how many people have uh, used textbooks where this is done. Doesn't Goldstein use that? Goldstein is abominable. <laughs> the, the new edition he's switched. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this use of imaginary time is bad for two reasons. First is you simply can't carry it over with any ease into general relativity, into curved space time at all. It's just, it uh, just can't, it can't be done in any manner. And the second reason is because in modern uh, mathematical physics or theoretical physics, there is a concept of imaginary time, which is, uh, plays a role in quantum gravity, and it is not this ICT. Okay? So if you go read Hawking, just read Hawking's little book, The Brief History of Time, you'll learn all about imaginary time in there. That's not this imaginary time. Okay, so I ask you to abandon thinking about an X4 that is ICT. The price of that is that when we write down a metric, we wind up with this minus sign in, uh, uh, in the squared lengths of uh, vectors that point in the time direction. You've got this minus sign. The squared lengths of vectors that point in the spatial directions, you've got this plus sign. And this uh, sign issue is something you just have to live with. There's a price of having abandoned the factor of i in here. You have to live with it. Uh, but in fact, it, uh, living with it uh, uh, becomes something that is far simpler to do when you're dealing with curved space time than it ever would be if you tried to maintain this way of thinking about time. Okay. Okay. So, questions? Okay, so let me give you another example of a vector, of a tensor. I've given you one example, and that is the metric. Another example, any vector is in fact a tensor. In particular, any vector can be thought of as being a machine with a slot, and you put another vector in there and you get out a real number that real number should be linear in the vector you stick in here. And so if I stick a vector in here, call it E, the real number that defines A viewed as a tensor is just the inner product, A dot E. That's obviously linear in E, So this, and it's real. So this is a, a perfectly good tensor. That's a definition of a tensor. This is a definition that says then, so the vector can be thought of as an arrow, it can be thought of as a directional derivative, and it can be thought of as a tensor uh, with one slot. That one point isn't in a dual space. Okay, so I'm not going to uh, carry around dual spaces. Uh, so um, uh, this is, I said this also uh, on Monday, but I want to say it again very clearly. If you really do do this subject properly, you carry around a bunch of extra additional mathematical structure. There is a dual space, which is called the space of one forms when you're doing it in a manifold. Uh, and uh, then you have, uh, it, uh, and th then you have, in addition to one forms, you have two forms, three forms, four forms. So you have all of the mathematics of exterior calculus that goes along with that, um, and that gives you a lot of power for uh, dealing with electromagnetic theory, for example. And uh, uh, it's something that is of, of considerable importance elsewhere in physics, but when you're dealing with gravitational waves, you don't buy much of anything by uh, making a distinction between the dual space and the vector space itself. So for those of you who know about dual spaces, uh, I'm going to 
abandon the dual space, I'm going to use the one-to-one -one mapping between one forms that live in the dual space and tangent vectors that live in the tangent space to simply abandon the dual the one forms and talk only about tangent vectors by using that one-to-one -one mapping. Okay. For those of you who don't know this subject, you can ignore the last uh, two minutes. Okay. <laughs> but you should remember that there is something there, and it's something that has a lot of power in certain subjects such as electromagnetic theory and integration theory uh, when, when you're do, doing, uh, def, defining and working with lots of integrals over submanifolds of, of, of space-time, for example. Okay. okay, any other questions? Yeah. Although I am not going to use dual spaces, uh, I just have one vector space, it's the tangent space at, at each point. I am going to use dual bases. So I'm going to carry around two different uh, sets of bases associated, say, with a coordinate system or wh whatever. So let me go over. I want now, in, in introducing this, this subject, to uh, abandon any assumption that the basis vectors I'm dealing with are these coordinate bases. They could be any set of basis vectors that live at this point. Okay. They might have come from a coordinate system or they might not have come from a coordinate system. So let's suppose that at some point P uh, we have a basis of vectors E alpha. Then I'm going to define a dual, a, another basis that I will call E up with an index mu. Alpha and mu are obviously, they're just dummy indices. They just stand for 0, 1, 2, 3. So this could have been E down mu, that could have been E up alpha. I don't, don't care about it. Okay. So I'm going to define a, a second basis. And the way I define it is that this is the set of vectors such that E up mu scalar product or inner product with E down alpha is the Kronecker delta. And if you think about it for a few minutes, you'll recognize that this is enough to determine completely what the E up mu's are, what the up basis is, once the down basis has been chosen. If, because uh, I have told you, uh, you pick E up zero, and I've told you it's scalar product with all the E downs. If you know it's, if you know it's projection onto each and every one of the E downs, then you know what this vector is completely. So if you think about that a little bit, and I think you'll convince yourself that's, that's true. Now, it's simply for a matter of convenience, in order to get a mathematical formalism that is very easy to work with. But that's the only reason I have introduced this uh, second basis. Okay. It gives us a formalism that uh, where uh, you don't have to memorize hardly anything. It gives you that's what we call an index shuffling formalism, where if you want to write down an equation and you know the basic idea, all you have to do is line up the indices according to certain rules, and you've got it right. Okay. And if you don't do this, uh, then you wind up with a formalism, a way of doing the mathematics where you have to remember lots of stuff. And since I have a lousy memory, uh, I much prefer something that gives me automatic ways to write down equations and get them right. So uh, I have this second basis then. Um, and. Uh, let me just give you an example uh, in order to illustrate what is going on here. So uh, the example is on the blackboard. Um, and on the blackboard, I could have uh, an, a, a Cartesian basis would be one choice, where I would have E uh, x, well, let's call it e, E1 pointing in that direction and E2 pointing in this direction. And these are unit vectors, and they're perpendicular to each other. That's what I mean when I say this is a Cartesian basis. Then it should be obvious 
that E2 scalar product with itself is 1, and E2 scalar product with E1 is 0, and that's just what I need in order to guarantee that this guy is also E up 2. And similarly, this guy is also E up 1. That is, these guys have the property that the inner product of E up 2 with E down 2 is unity, inner product of E up 2 with E down 1 is 0, and similarly for the other inner products. So for a Cartesian basis, uh, the up basis vectors are the same as the down basis vectors. Suppose instead, though, I have a basis that is skewed, a non-Cartesian basis. Let's suppose that, uh, that E1 is a long vector like that, and E2 is a rather long vector like this, and they're off, uh, pointing off. This is E down 1, E down 2. They're pointing off in a skewed manner of that sort. So then the question is, what are E up 1 and 2? So E up 1 has to be orthogonal to E down 2. So it lies pointing in that direction. Then its length is determined by the fact that its scalar product with E down 1 has to be unity. And since E down 1 is quite long, this is going to be relatively short. And so E um, up 2, um, I'm sorry, e, e up 1 is this guy. It has unit scalar product with E down 1. It has zero scalar product with E up 2. Then E up 2 has to have zero scalar product with E down 1 and unit scalar product with E down 2. So that's E up 2. So my up basis is also skewed. But these guys are short if those guys are long. It's skewed in such a manner that E up 2 is orthogonal to E1. Is also, if this were in higher dimensions, it's orthogonal to E0. It's orthogonal to e, uh, E3. It has unit uh, inner product with E down 2. Another example, in space-time, in a Lorentz or inertial frame, E down 0 points in the time direction, and it has unit length. But unit length means that E down 0, because it's a time-like vector, the scalar product with itself is minus 1. E down 1 points in a spatial direction and has E down 1 dot E down 1 is equal to plus 1. Now I need E up 1 to be perpendicular to E down 0 and have unit length. And that's already just what E down 1 is doing. So E up 1 is the same thing as E down 1. E up 0 has to have be perpendicular to E1, so it points in the same direction as E down 0. But it has to have a scalar product with E down 0 that is plus 1. That means that E up 0 points like that. So that its scalar product with E down 0 is plus 1. And so in space-time, this peculiar nature of time, the fact that time behaves different in physics than space does, it uh, uh, turns out that that feeds through the definition of the inner product and into the definition of the metric and into the uh, properties then of, of the basis vectors in such a way but even in an inertial reference frame, uh, the up bases are not the same as the down. The uh, time up basis points opposite to the time down basis for the, for the time direction. OK. Questions? So now we'll begin to see what we have bought by doing this. It, well, in, in a moment, we will. Before I do, do that, begin to see what we have bought, I want to introduce the tensor product of two of, of vectors. 
if I have two vectors a and b, or let's say three vectors, a, b, and c, from them I get a tensor that has three slots. And this is called the tensor product. Uh, and it is defined as soon as I tell you the real number that I get out when I stick vectors in these slots. So I stick u in here, v in here, and w in here. And the real number I get is a evaluated on u multiplied by b evaluated on v multiplied by uh, c evaluated on w. The value of a on u, of course, is just the inner product, a dot u. This is the inner product, b dot v. This is the inner product, c dot w. So it's the, the multiply those three inner products together, and you get the value of this tensor on those three vectors. Um, having then introduced that tensor product, and these two bases, I can now lay out the key ideas of index shuffling. First of all, suppose that I have a vector, or a tensor T. Let's suppose it has three slots. By the way, the number of slots is called the rank of the tensor. So this is a rank three tensor. A vector is a rank one tensor. Um, I can expand that out in terms of any basis that I may have as T alpha beta gamma, E alpha tensor product, E beta tensor product, E gamma. In other words, these tensor products form a basis for third rank tensors. And I can expand in this basis with coefficients that are the components the up components of uh, T. I can also um, expand if I wish. By the way, so in space time, there's a sum over alpha from 0 to 3, beta from 0 to 3, and gamma from 0 to 3. So there are 4 times 4 times 4. There are uh, 64 terms in this sum. I can also expand this as T uh, mu uh, nu gamma E up mu tensor product E up nu tensor product E down gamma. Now you notice these are just definitions at the moment of the components. These are the, these, this defines the components. I haven't done anything except definitions of, of these components of T. But I've done my definitions in such a way that uh, when I'm summing over indices, uh, I must always have one up and one down, a gamma up, a gamma down, a mu down, mu up, a nu down, nu up. Okay. Over here, alpha, beta, gamma are all up, alpha, beta, gamma are all down. And I have done that because that enables me to get out the index shuffling formalism that I promised you you don't have to memorize anything for. Okay. That's the, the reason I've done that. And so I'm going to now tell you a theorem 